Welcome everyone to the Mysteries Abound podcast, episode 57. This is your host, Paul. And this episode is entitled, The Death of Superman. That story coming up later, but until then, from the www.todayifoundout.com website, This Day in History, 1374, thousands of people on the streets of Arch in Germany suddenly suffer from the forgotten plague. Dance Mania. And it's an article by Dave and Hiskey. Amidst our people here is come, the madness of the dance. In every town there now are some who fall upon a trance. It drives them ever night and day. They scarcely stop for breath, till some have stopped along the way, and some are met by death. That's from a 17th century poem about dance mania. On this day in history, 1374, people on the streets of Arch in Germany inexplicably began dancing around and reportedly experiencing hallucinations with an apparent case of St. John's Dance or the Dance Plague, with their numbers swelling into the thousands before the event ceased. This was the first of the two best documented cases of this phenomenon, though this sort of thing wasn't unheard of with instances as far back as the 7th century. It also occasionally popped up along the way up to the 17th century. While a mass number of people suddenly breaking out into hysteric dance and sometimes song may sound funny and today YouTube gold, in fact it was anything but at the time. The people would continue vigorously jumping and dancing about, sometimes also screaming out or chanting, until completely exhausted, at which point they would collapse and some would die from cardiac arrest or injuries suffered from their violent dance. Those who didn't die, once exhausted, would often twitch around on the ground, foaming at the mouth and gasping, until they were able to once again get up and continue their dance. This dance mania in some cases would last for weeks or even months. Besides dancing, participants would also sometimes roll around in the dirt squealing and acting like animals. Others would rip off their clothing and sometimes would begin having sex with other dance mania participants. Some would also scream for people to beat the bottoms of their feet while they writhed on the ground, or would other times try to get people to throw them high in the air. Others would make crude or sexual gestures at those around them and threaten to attack spectators who refused to join in the hysteric dance. At the time it was thought that this hysteric dancing was possibly caused by demons possessing people, a curse, hot blood and a number of other wild guesses. Today most take a more pragmatic view of things. One of the more popular theories is that these dance mania events were carefully organised possibly by a religious cult or cults who were performing some ritual or other, not unlike certain rituals ancient Romans and ancient Greeks used to perform. This is somewhat supported by the fact that many of the instigators of dance mania events were often people on pilgrimages. Normally this sort of behaviour would have gotten them burned at the stake or the like, but masking it as a mass outbreak would sometimes allow them to perform their ritual publicly without retribution. Another theory is that it was caused by ergotism, also called St. Anthony's fire. Specifically, the rye and other foodstuffs eaten by people may have been infected with a fungus called Claviceps purpurea, which in turn contains alkaloids that cause hallucinations, seizures, mania, convulsions, irrational behaviour and unconsciousness. However, it is also associated with loss of limbs due to restricted blood circulation, and these incidents of dance mania don't seem to be connected with many of the people having their limbs become gangrenous. Another popular theory, which seems the most reasonable, is that due to the extreme stress people were often under during these times, where dance mania would often pop up, such as rampant plagues, floods, poverty, etc., it simply started with a few people snapping and others joining in. As the numbers swelled, herd behaviour took over and a form of mass hysteria resulted, 
As the hysteria reached a fever pitch, people were even willing to inflict serious physical injury upon themselves, even to the point of death from injury or exhaustion, seemingly unable to stop. In the extreme, this could potentially cause hallucinations and the like, as people became sleep-deprived, dehydrated, malnourished, and physically exhausted. Popular cures for dance mania at the time included praying to St. John the Baptist. Some even thought perhaps he was causing the dancing, hence the name St. John's Dance. Performing mass exorcisms on people afflicted by the dance. Getting musicians to play. The musicians would attempt to try to match their music to the general pace of the dance, then once they did so, would gradually slow the pace down in attempt to get people to stop. Even though this was considered a common cure, it more often than not appears to have caused the number of participants to swell. Along the same line of reasoning as adding music to the dance to stop it, one wonders why they didn't just all go out and distribute free alcohol. That would have cured it for sure. On that note, another popular cure was to use musicians in another way. In this case, they'd actually try to encourage dancing with musicians and they'd even build dance stages where people could dance it out. Some believe the dance was caused by hot blood and the only way to cure it was for people to dance continuously, day and night, until the affliction passed. Thus they provided the facilities and musicians who were instructed to keep people dancing as long as possible. And if you're interested in the article and would like to read the bonus facts, go to the show notes at www.origins.info, click on the Mysteries Abound podcast link, and then on episode 57, and then on the link to this article. There's about another seven or eight bonus factoids if you're interested. It stands in the middle of suburban San Jose, California. You might not even notice it was there as you drive by, unless someone points it out. Still, this mansion just across the street from a strip mall and down a little bit from a movie complex is perhaps the strangest home ever built. Some people say it is haunted. Most certainly the woman who built it was haunted, if only by her own fears. From the www.unmuseum.org website, an article by Lee Christek, The Winchester Mansion. The story of this unique dwelling starts in 1839 with the birth of Sarah Party in New Haven, Connecticut. Sarah grew into a charming and striking young woman, though she stood less than five feet in height. She soon drew the attention of a young man from New Haven named William Wirt Winchester. Mr. Winchester's father, Oliver Winchester, was a successful businessman who in 1857 bought a company that made repeating rifles. He changed the name of the business to the Winchester Repeating Arms Company and redesigned the rifle to make it more effective. This new version, the Henry, was capable of firing a shot every three seconds, a vast improvement over most guns at the time. The Henry soon became popular with Union troops during the Civil War and led to huge government contracts for the Winchester Company, allowing the family to amass an enormous fortune. In 1862, Sarah married William, who soon became the heir to this vast fortune. Good times did not last for Mrs Winchester, however. In 1866, she had her first and only child, a girl named Annie. The child contracted marasmus and died in less than ten days. The event drove Mrs Winchester to the edge of insanity. She eventually recovered, but a little more than ten years later, in 1881, tragedy struck again when William died of tuberculosis. With his death, Mrs Winchester inherited over $20 million, a vast fortune for that time. 
The story goes that Mrs Winchester, inconsolable over her losses, was directed by a friend to a psychic medium for advice. This medium told her that the Winchester family was under a curse. The ghosts of all those thousands of men, felled by Winchester arms, now wanted revenge. They had killed her daughter and her husband, and they would soon kill her. According to the story, the medium urged Mrs Winchester to move west. That she did. In 1884, settling in the area of San Jose, California, supposedly guided by her dead husband. The change of location might well have had as much to do with her health as with any ghost, however. Mrs Winchester suffered from advanced arthritis, and the area's Mediterranean-like climate was thought to ease the pain of aching joints. In any case, Mrs Winchester soon found a house still under construction that she liked and bought it along with 162 acres of surrounding land. Apparently one of the conditions set upon her by the medium in order to appease the spirits was that she must continue the construction of the house, never stopping. For the next 36 years, Sarah Winchester kept a staff of 22 craftsmen busy 24 hours a day, seven days a week, building, altering and rebuilding the house. There was no master plan, but each morning Sarah would meet her foreman and show him her sketches for that day's work. Rooms were added to rooms, which soon grew into whole wings. Eventually the mansion reached a height of seven storeys and had three elevators and 47 fireplaces. The building was, to say the least, odd. Stairs disappeared into ceilings. Doors opened out into thin air from upper storeys. Skylights were placed in the floors of upper rooms. Closets opened into solid walls. Stair posts were installed upside down. And chimneys stopped short of the roof. It is unclear exactly what Mrs Winchester was trying to accomplish in her design. Was she trying to appease the spirits? Fill them? Or trap them? Mrs Winchester seemed to have a flair for design. She was also intrigued with the number 13 and repeated it throughout the house. Many of the windows had 13 panes. An imported chandelier was altered to carry 13 candles. The greenhouse had 13 copulas. All the stairways except one had 13 steps. Despite the size of the house, Mrs Winchester lived in the mansion alone for most of her years with only servants for company. Perhaps her only release from this self-contained solitude was playing the piano, which could often be heard by those passing by outside. Mrs Winchester's building program met with disaster, however, on April 18, 1906. On that day, a major earthquake struck the region, the upper part of the house collapsed, never to be rebuilt. Mrs Winchester was trapped in her bedroom when the chimney fell and had to be rescued. Soon after, however, workmen cleared away the rubble and construction started again. Thirty rooms at the front of the house, however, were walled off and would never be completed. For the next 16 years, rooms were added one after another. Then on September 5, 1922, Sarah Winchester died in her sleep at the age of 83. The furnishings were removed and the mansion was sold to a group of investors who opened it as a tourist attraction, which it remains so today. Because there was no master plan, nobody is really sure how many rooms are in the building. Each new count seems to come up with a different number. It is estimated, however, that there are around 160 rooms. The estate has been designated a California historical landmark and the city has grown up around it. All but four and a half of its original 162 acres have been sold off to feed the expansion of the city. Is the mansion haunted? Sarah Winchester was convinced it was and conducted regular seances to keep in touch with the spirits. Staff members at the mansion have reported seeing strange things. Doorknobs that move by themselves. Cold spots where they shouldn't be. Windows that banged closed so hard they'd shatter. The house remains perhaps the most well-known example of a haunted house in the United States. 
Stephen King's miniseries, Rose Red, about a haunted mansion that builds itself, was inspired by the Winchester Mansion. Steven Spielberg, who produced the show, briefly considered using the actual Winchester Mansion as a location, but there wasn't enough room there to accommodate filming. Much of the exterior shots for Rose Red were instead filmed at Thornwood Castle near Tacoma, Washington. The Winchester House, whether it is haunted or not, remains an important landmark of San Jose. There it sits today amid suburbia, a sprawling giant that is a memorial to one eccentric woman's unearthly fears and visions. On first glance, the title of this story seems like every chocoholic's dream. Death by chocolate. But reading further, it's, as usual, not what one thinks. Death by chocolate, a plot to kill Sir Winston Churchill. And this comes from the www.telegraph.co.uk website. A Nazi plot to kill Sir Winston Churchill with a bar of exploding chocolate during the Second World War has been revealed in historic papers. Giving a new meaning to the dessert name, Death by Chocolate, Adolf Hitler's bomb makers coated explosive devices with a thin layer of rich, dark chocolate, then packaged it in expensive looking black and gold paper. The Germans apparently planned to use secret agents working in Britain to discreetly place the bars, branded as Peter's Chocolate, among other luxury items taken into the dining room used by the War Cabinet during the conflict. The lethal slabs of confection were packed with enough explosives to kill anyone within several metres. But the plot was foiled by British spies, who discovered the chocolate was being made and tipped off one of MI5's most senior intelligence chiefs, Lord Victor Rothschild, before the wartime Prime Minister's life could be endangered. Lord Rothschild, a scientist in peacetime, as well as a key member of the Rothschild banking family, immediately typed a letter to a talented illustrator, seconded to his unit asking him to draw poster-sized images of the chocolate to warn the public to be on the lookout. His letter to the artist Lawrence Fish is dated May 4th, 1943 and was written from his secret bunker in Parliament Street, London. It was unearthed by Mr Fish's wife, journalist Jean Bray, as she sorted through his possessions after the artist's death at the age of 89 in 2009. The letter, marked secret, reads, Dear Fish, I wonder if you could do a drawing for me of an explosive slab of chocolate. We have received information that the enemy are using pound slabs of chocolate, which are made of steel with a very thin covering of real chocolate. Inside there is high explosive and some form of delay mechanism. When you break off a piece of chocolate at one end in the normal way, instead of it falling away, a piece of canvas is revealed, stuck into the middle of the piece which has been broken off, and a ticking into the middle of the remainder of the slab. The letter explained how the mechanism would be activated when the piece of chocolate was pulled sharply, which would also pull the canvas, and Lord Rothschild said he was enclosing a very poor sketch, done by someone who had seen one of the bars. He asked the artist to indicate in the text of his drawing that a bomb would go off several seconds after the piece of chocolate and attached canvas was pulled out.
from the www.lifeslittlemysteries.com website. The sky crucifix in ancient text may be mystery solving supernova. According to an old English manuscript chronicling the history of the Anglo-Saxons, a mysterious red crucifix appeared in the heavens over Britain one evening in AD 774. Now astronomers say it may have been the supernova explosion that sprinkled unexplained traces of carbon-14 in tree rings that year, halfway around the world in Japan. Jonathan Allen, an undergraduate student at the University of California, Santa Cruz, made the connection this week after listening to a nature podcast. He heard a team of Japanese scientists discussing new research in which they measured an odd spike in carbon-14 levels in tree rings from the year AD 774 or 775. They thought the spike must have come from a burst of high-energy radiation, striking the upper atmosphere and triggering an increase in the rate of carbon-14 formation. But a mystery was afoot. The scientists could not find any records indicating a massive supernova or solar flare was observed in the skies in the AD 1770s, and the event would have had to be visible to produce a sufficiently large influx of radiation. Alan A. Biochemistry major with an interest in history became intrigued. According to Nature News, he did a quick Google search and came across an English translation of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, a history of England written in the 9th century with this line in the entry for AD 774. This year also appeared in the heavens a red crucifix after sunset. It made me think it's some sort of stellar event, Alan was quoted as saying in Nature. He thought the evening sky's object's red colour might indicate that it was shrouded by a dust cloud, which would have scattered all but a small amount of red light such a cloud might also prevent remnants of the proposed supernova from being visible to modern astronomers. The connection is plausible, according to Giza Gyuk, an astronomer at Chicago's Adler Planetarium in Illinois, who has used the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle to investigate past astronomical events. The wording suggests that the object was seen in the western skies shortly after sunset. That would mean that it would have moved behind the sun, where it could not be seen, as Earth orbited the Sun, Gilk told Nature. That, along with the dimness of the new star due to dust, would go a long way to explaining why no one else would have seen or recorded the event. However, connections between the scientific and historical records are seldom watertight. The red crucifix could have been something else entirely. Past astronomers have attempted to explain the chronicle entry as an early description of the Northern Lights, or an optical effect caused by light glinting off high-altitude ice particles, creating both vertical and horizontal bands of light. And to the music called Deserted by Elijah Bossenbrock, three short stories from the website www.beyondreligion.com. A Glimpse of the Afterlife In my dream I found myself face down on a sandy hill. I opened my eyes and felt as if I was beginning to slide down the hill. So I got scared and yelled, Jesus, save me. Immediately I felt a hand holding me up. Suddenly I felt safe. I looked at this place and realised I was on a hill in a valley. The valley was the most beautiful, rich green, and in the distance I saw a light. I thought it was the sun. The light was very bright, but it did not hurt to look at it. It was white with a golden hue, and it felt as if warmth and love emanated from it. I realise it seems crazy to say this about a light, but it really felt as if the light had a personality. It was alive. And then I looked down and saw a river that I shall never forget. 
The river was so clear, it seemed to have a life of its own. And I kept looking at it, fascinated, because of what was in there. It's as if the river was filled with millions of little sparkling lights. That river was alive. It was living. There was life in it. Then I woke up. I wanted to see that place again. I wanted to go back there and stay there. I wanted to experience that total warmth, safety, love and sense of acceptance I had just experienced. But that was not to be. I thought a lot about this dream. Was I granted a tiny glimpse of the afterlife? Was that river what some call the river of life? A soul departing. I have over 20 years experience as an ICU trauma nurse. An experience I shall never forget occurred over 15 years ago in a step-down unit. I was working the night shift in the ICU as team leader. The step-down unit was next to our unit. At 0200 a young nurse from the step-down unit came over and asked me to check on a patient whose eyes were open but who was not responding to verbal or noxious stimuli. When I saw the patient it became evident a code blue, for cardiac arrest, had to be started right away. That night we were short on IV poles, so I played the role of IV pole, holding up the bags of fluids and overseeing the code. Later, one of the respiratory therapists took over the IV pole role and I went to sit on a chair. I had a really good view of the patient. Suddenly I saw something that amazed me. From the patient's chest area, I saw something rise into the air. The best way I can describe it is that it looked like that shimmering one sees rising over the highway on a very hot summer day. It appeared to be contained, nearly oval in shape, but I lost sight of it when it reached about three feet above the patient. At the same time, something inside told me that the patient was not coming back. And she did not. She was only 52 years old and, as we sometimes say in the medical field, had no reason to take such a turn. And finally, pre-birth memories. I always longed to recall my birth or even my existence pre-birth, but until recently I thought I could not. When I was four years old, my family moved to a new home. I have memories of us house shopping with a real estate agent. I was in the basement of an unfamiliar home. There was a goldfish bowl on a brown bookshelf, and I was very excited because I thought that if we bought the house, I could own the goldfish. I remember the presence of a gentle man being nearby. I always thought he was the real estate agent. However, I don't remember actually seeing the man just feeling his presence and his caring voice. He told me that this was not going to be my house because life there would be too difficult. In retrospect, it would have been odd for a real estate agent to tell clients that it would be difficult there. The next thing I remember is being outside of a three or four storey building. In this memory, I am looking up at one of the top floors and wanting to go to live in there. It was like I was floating and I don't even have a sense that I had a body. I only had a consciousness. I recall a warm feeling of peace and excitement from looking at that upper window. I also have a memory of seeing my older brother when he was three years of age on the day that I was born. I recall my brother standing at the window by a white radiator having a temper tantrum because my parents were leaving for the hospital to give birth to me. My brother was left with our aunt and uncle, and he was hysterical. I remember this as clearly as if I had seen it on TV. I recently asked my mother about these memories. She told me that we did not view any homes prior to our move. She said there was no basement and no goldfish bowl. They did not consider moving to an apartment, but she said that I was born on the top floor of a three or four story medical building. To my shock, she verified the story of my brother's tantrum when she left for the hospital to have me. I was shocked to realise that after all these years, 
Perhaps I did have pre-birth memories which I hadn't recognised. The goldfish bowl house could have been God helping me to select my family. He warned me that it would be too challenging for me to live with that family. The fourth floor building is where I was born. That's why I was hovering outside, eager to go in the window. And somehow I watched my mother leave for the hospital when she was in labour with me. Amazing. From the www.prairieghosts.com website The Death of Superman The Unsolved Death and Mysterious Afterlife of Television's Superman George Reeves Superman died at 1.59am on June 16th, 1959. Not the comic book character, of course, but the man who personified the real Superman for an entire generation of television fans. George Reed's, it was discovered, was not faster than a speeding bullet after all. Even though the initial coroner's report listed Reeves' death as indicated suicide. After more than four decades, there are many who do not believe that he killed himself. The death of Superman remains an unsolved mystery. Could this be why his ghost is still said to haunt his former Benedict Canyon drive home? George Reeves grew up as George Bacello. His mother Helen became pregnant in her hometown of Galesburg, Illinois, eloped, and then moved to Iowa. Shortly after settling in, she divorced her husband, took baby George, and moved to Pasadena, California. It would not be until George joined the army during World War II that he would discover a number of parts of his life that his mother had hidden from him. She had concealed his true birth date, the identity of his father, and the fact that his stepfather had committed suicide eight years after Helen had divorced him. This so disturbed Reeves that he did not speak to her through most of the 1940s. Growing up, Reeves was an accomplished athlete, and in 1932 he entered the Golden Globes boxing competition against his mother's wishes. He did well in the competition and went to the Olympics in Los Angeles in 1932. After having his nose broken nine times as a boxer, he hung up his gloves and decided to try his hand at an acting career. In spite of his time in the ring and rugged good looks, Reeves was not a tough guy. In fact, one writer, James Beaver, discovered that Reeves was a totally decent person. I honestly never spoke to anyone who didn't like him a lot. He began to take acting lessons at the Pasadena Playhouse, where he met his first and only wife, Eleonora Needles. They married in 1940 and divorced nine years later. Like most struggling performers, Reeves took a number of small parts. In his very first film, he played a minor role as one of the red-headed twins and armoured with Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind. His other screen credits included So Proudly We Hail, From Here to Eternity, Blood and Sand, and Samson and Delilah with Victor Mature and Hedy Lamarr. But of course, Reeves' claim to fame came when he was selected to play the mild-mannered reporter, Clark Kent, who was really Superman. His portrayal of the character on television became wildly popular, and everywhere he went, children and adults clamoured to meet him and obtain his autograph. Reeves loved the public, and it was said that he loved the ladies as well. Many who were close to Reeves say that he was a womaniser, breaking the heart of many of the actresses that he worked with. Rumour also had it that he became involved with a number of prominent married women, like the wives of film executives and other actors. It is believed that one of these affairs may have led to his death. 
In the three months before his death, Reeves was involved in three mysterious automobile mishaps that almost killed him. The first time, his car was nearly crushed by two trucks on the freeway. Another time, a speeding car nearly killed him, but he survived thanks to his quick athletic reflexes. The third time, Reeves's brakes failed on a narrow twisting road. All of the brake fluid, it was discovered, was gone from the hydraulic system, in spite of the fact that an examination by a mechanic found the system was in perfect working order. When the mechanic suggested that someone had pumped out the fluid, George dismissed the notion, said Arthur Wiseman, Reeves' best friend and business manager. Wiseman always remained convinced that his friend had been murdered. He tried to convince Reeves that he needed to be careful, but Reeves brushed off the warnings. About a month later, he began to receive death threats on his unlisted telephone line. Most of them came late at night, and there were sometimes 20 or more each day. Often who was ever calling would simply hang up when he answered. They said nothing, but after a few graphic and detailed threats followed, Reeves knew it was the same person. Nervous after the near misses in his car, Reeves filed a report with the Beverly Hills Police Department and a complaint with the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office. He even went so far as to suggest a suspect, a woman named Tony Mannix. It was never explained why Reeves openly pointed the finger at Tony. The Hollywood gossip columnists had linked the two romantically for some time, but their relationship was never a public one. They were a secret couple, as Reeves was engaged to Lenore Lemon and Tony was married to a man named Eddie Mannix, the vice president of Lowe's Theatres Incorporated, and a former studio executive at MGM. According to Reeves' friend Arthur Wiseman, it was no secret that Eddie Mannix was disliked by everyone and was an uncouth and despicable man. He also believed that Mannix was responsible for the threats and attempts on Reeves' life. The DA's office investigated Reeves's complaint and it was soon discovered that both Tony and George were receiving telephone threats and crank calls. When that was disclosed, many people assumed that it was Eddie Mannix who had instigated the calls through employees or hired thugs. Wiseman believed that Mannix was behind Reeves's near-fatal auto crashes as well. In the film and theatre businesses, Mannix had access to a lot of people outside of the general public. For a price, these men could manoeuvre two trucks close together on the highway, or could drain the brake fluid from someone's car. Furthermore, he was sure that Mannix also had access to someone who could arrange a murder too. In spite of these personal crises, Reeves was on a professional high. He was not in any way despondent, and in fact he had much to live for. Things were certainly going his way, and offers were pouring in to cash in on his Superman celebrity status. Just three days after his death, he was to have returned to the boxing rink with light heavyweight champion Archie Moore. The exhibition match was to be played on television so that viewers across the country could tune in to see Superman beat the champ. Reeves told reporters that the Archie Moore fight will be the highlight of my life. After the fight, he was going to marry his fiancée, Lenore Lemon, an attractive brunette and former New York socialite. They were to honeymoon in Spain and then go to Australia for six weeks, where Reeves would pick up over $20,000 for public appearances as Superman. The series had just been sold to an Australian television network and local viewers were demanding to meet the Man of Steel. Reeves then planned to return to Hollywood later in the year and star in a feature film that he would direct. He was then scheduled to shoot more episodes of Superman for syndication and with a hefty salary increase. This was not the sort of future that would cause a man to commit suicide. It could even be said that George Reeves had everything to live for. But it all came to an end on June 16. Around 6.30 that evening, dinner was served at the Benedict Canyon home. Lenore Lemon had prepared it for Reeves and guest Robert Condon, a writer who was there to do an article on Reeves and the upcoming exhibition with Archie Moore. After dinner, they settled down in the living room to watch television. About midnight, everyone went to bed. Around 1 or 1.30am, a friend of Lenore and Reeves, Carol von Ronkel, came by the house with another friend, William Bliss. Even though the house was the frequent site of parties and entertaining, Reeves had an unspoken rule that he did not want guests after midnight. 
However, Von Ronkel and Bliss banged on the door until Lenore got up and let them in. George also got up and came downstairs in his bathrobe. He yelled at them for showing up so late at night. Lenore calmed him down and a few minutes later he poured a nightcap and then went back upstairs to his room. At that point, the other witnesses present stated that Lenore said something like, Well, he's sulking. He'll probably go up to his room and shoot himself. Moments later, a shot rang out in the quiet of the house. George Reeves, television superman, was dead. The Beverly Hills Police report of the incident states that while entertaining his fiancée and three others in his home, Reeves suddenly, and without explanation, left the room and impulsively committed suicide. He went up to his bedroom, they said, placed a pistol against his right ear and pulled a trigger. Even though he believed his friend was murdered, Arthur Wiseman surprisingly did not dispute this sequence of events. He said that this was just how it happened, but that Reeves did not intend to kill himself. He explained that Reeves was just playing his favourite game, a practical joke he enjoyed with a gun that was loaded with a blank. According to Wiseman, that's why Lenore said what she did. All of Reeves's friends knew that when he was drinking, he would sometimes fire a blank at his head in a mock suicide attempt, making certain that his arm was far enough away so that he didn't get powder burns on his face. Wiseman claimed that, unknown to Reeves, the blank was replaced with a real bullet by someone hired by Eddie Mannix. Reeves's clandestine girlfriend, Tony Mannix, was an actress and former model who was 25 years younger than her powerful husband. She was also madly in love with Reeves, and according to Wiseman, their relationship was an open Hollywood secret. It continued for years, and then came to an end when George announced that he was marrying Lenore Lemon. Friends said that Tony was enraged over this new development and began bombarding Reeves with phone calls, making all sorts of threats. It was believed that both she and her husband were openly humiliated by Reeves over the affair. Both had the perfect opportunity to seek revenge, especially since Tony possessed a key to the Reeves' house. Many were unhappy with the findings of indicated suicide, including Reeves' mother, Helen Bessalo. She retained the Nick Harris detectives of Los Angeles to look into the case. At that time, a man named Milo Speriglio was a novice investigator at the firm and played a small role in the investigation. Nearly everyone in Hollywood has always been led to believe that George Reeves' death was a suicide, he said in a later interview. Not everyone believed it then, nor do they believe it now. I am one of those who does not, and neither did Helen Bessalo. She went to her grave in 1964, convinced that her son was murdered. The Nick Harris Agency, which had been founded in Los Angeles before the FBI was even in existence, quickly came to believe that Reeves' death had been a homicide. Even based on the fact that many of the witnesses that night were intoxicated and incoherent, the detectives felt that they could rule out suicide. Unfortunately though, the Beverly Hills Police investigators chose to ignore their findings. A review of the facts seems to indicate the agency's suspicions were well-founded. To make matters more confusing, the detectives even managed to rule out Reeves's macabre suicide game as the cause of his death. The agency operatives believed that someone else was in the house at the time. For one thing, the absence of powder burns on Reeves's face shows that he did not hold the gun to his head, as the police report stated. For the weapon to have not left any facial burns, it had to be at least a foot and a half away from Reeves' head, which is totally impractical in a suicide attempt. In addition, Reeves was discovered after his death lying on his back. The single shell was found under his body. According to experts, self-inflicted gunshot wounds usually propel the victim forward, away from the expended bullet casing. Detective Speriglio made a careful examination of the police report and noticed that the bullet wound was described as irregular. So the agency reconstructed the bullet entry and exit. The slug had exited Reeves's head and was found lodged in the ceiling. His head at the moment of death would have to have been twisted, making a self-inflicted shot improbable. Speriglio suspected that an intruder had entered Reeves's room and that the actor had found his gun. A struggle had followed and Reeves was shot. 
the intruder then escaped from the house unnoticed. While interesting, this theory does not explain why the gun, normally loaded with blanks, had a bullet in it, and how the intruder escaped from the house with other people inside. Regardless, there is another discrepancy with the police report. It stated that Reeves had pulled the trigger of the gun with his right hand. Prior to his death, Reeves had been in a terrible auto accident. His Jaguar had hit an oil slick in the Hollywood Hills and crashed into a brick wall. Reeves later filed a personal injury claim in Los Angeles Superior Court asking for half a million dollars in damages because his right hand was disabled. But just how disabled was it? If Reeves could fight Archie Moore in an exhibition match, then surely he could have pulled the trigger on a pistol. Regardless of whether or not he killed himself, it was obvious that Reeves' death was never properly investigated. Police investigators never even bothered to take fingerprints at the scene, and people like Arthur Wiseman believed that they were pressured to make it an open and shut case. George Reeves, according to the official findings, had committed suicide. But did he really? We will never know for sure. In 1961, Reeves's body was exhumed and cremated, forever destroying what evidence was left behind. The death of George Reeves will always remain another unsolved Hollywood mystery. Could this be why ghostly phenomena have been reported at the former Reeves' house ever since? Many people believe that the ghostly appearances by the actor lend credence to the idea that he was murdered. Over the years, occupants of the house have been plagued by not only the sound of a single gunshot that echoes in the darkness, but strange lights and even the apparition of George Reeves. After Reeves' death, realtors attempted to sell the house to settle the actor's estate. Unfortunately, though, they had trouble. Occupants would not stay long because they would report inexplicable noises in the upstairs bedroom where George had been killed. When they would go to investigate the sounds, they would find the room was not as they had left it. Often the bedding would be torn off, clothing would be strewn about, and some reported the ominous odour of gunpowder in the air. One tenant also reported that his German shepherd would stand in the doorway of the room and would bark furiously as though he could see something his owners could not. There is also documentation of an extraordinary occurrence when two Los Angeles sheriffs were assigned to watch the house after neighbours reported hearing screams, gunshots and lights going on and off during the night. New occupants moved out quickly, becoming completely unnerved after encountering Reeves's ghost decked out in his Superman costume. The first couple who spotted him were not the first, nor the last, to see him either. Many later residents saw him too, and one couple became so frightened that they moved out of the house the same night. Later, the ghost was even reported on the front lawn by neighbouring residents. In the 1980s, while the house was being used as a set for a television show, the ghost made another startling appearance. He was seen by several of the actors and crew members before abruptly vanishing, creating yet another mystery in this strange and convoluted case. The music for the Mysteries Abound podcast comes from the musicalley.com website. The bandwidth is provided by TalkShoe at www.talkshoe.com. And if you're looking for a link to the articles, the title of a piece of music or the artist who created it, these are all listed in the show notes at www.origins.info. Under J. Edgar Hoover, everybody who was anybody had an FBI file. 
Here are some interesting things we found while poking around their archives. And this is an article by Lucas Riley, writing for the mentalfloss.com website. Nine intriguing excerpts from old FBI files. Number one, Albert Einstein. Our favourite scientist's file is over 1,800 pages long. Einstein's German roots always made the Bureau nervous. It didn't help that he was an outspoken pacifist and socialist, not to mention a harsh critic of Senator Joseph McCarthy. When Einstein was asked to join the Manhattan Project in 1939, the FBI concluded that, in view of his radical background, this office would not recommend the employment of Dr. Einstein of matters of a secret nature without a very careful investigation, as it seems unlikely that a man of his background could, in such a short time, become a loyal American citizen. The FBI suspected that Einstein was a German spy and planned to deport him once they found proof. Notwithstanding his worldwide reputation as a scientist, Einstein may properly be investigated for possible revocation of naturalization. The bureau came up empty. Number two, Colonel Sanders. Colonel Sanders admired J. Edgar Hoover and occasionally requested favors from him. One time the Colonel asked Hoover to come over to his birthday party, which now rests in his FBI file. And this article has a scan of the letter, but I'll read it to you, seeing it's an audio podcast. Dear Mr. Hoover, it's not very often that people of our age can get together and celebrate, but I've found a good excuse. On September 16th, I'm going to be 80 years old. To help me enjoy the day, I'd like to have you and a group of us old folk come down to Louisville as my guests. I do believe that us folk can show those young people what celebrating's all about. I, of course, will arrange for all transportation and hotel reservations. Just call on my secretary, Wanda Boner, and tell her when you will all be in town. Open to hear from you all soon. I remain Colonel Harland Sanders. And that's dated August 25, 1917. And there's a little footnote to this. After searching the Colonel's criminal record, Hoover gently declined. Number three, extrasensory perception. In 1957, William Foos began pretending to read through walls. Weeks later, the FBI was at his door asking if his powers were real. Should his claims be well-founded, there is no limit to the value which could accrue to the FBI. Complete and undetectable access to mail, the diplomatic pouch, visual access to buildings. The possibilities are unlimited insofar as law enforcement and counterintelligence are concerned. It is difficult to see how the Bureau can afford to not inquire into this matter more fully. Bureau interest can be completely discreet and controlled and no embarrassment would result. Foos went on to perform elaborate card tricks for FBI agents, CIA members, and leading military officers, but the government became suspicious when he refused to divulge his methods. After consulting a slew of psychologists and university studies, the FBI dropped the case, leaving behind this 40-page file on ESP. Number 4. The Grateful Dead most of the Grateful Dead's pages are suspiciously blacked out with marker. The file does show, however, how clueless the FBI was about pop music trends. When mentioning the Grateful Dead for the first time, it says, It would appear this is a rock group of some sort. The FBI had suspected Jerry Garcia's group was tied to the criminal drug circle. LSD originates from San Francisco, California, through a renowned rock group known as Grateful Dead. Despite its suspicions, the FBI decided not to investigate further. Number 5. Liberace. The FBI holds over 400 pages on Liberace. Most pages focus on a robbery in 1974 
when someone stole hundreds of Liberace's jewels. Other pages look into numerous extortion attempts that attacked Liberace's sexuality. A meagre two pages, however, show that the rhinestone-clad pianist illegally bet on horse races through a bookie in Buffalo, New York. The FBI considered roasting Liberace before a grand jury, but later decided against it. Number 6. Louie Louie The FBI spent 30 months investigating the song Louie Louie because the lyrics were thought to be dirty. The song was playing across America and naughty lyrics would have violated a code that forbade the distribution of obscene material. Agents listened to the records at different speeds, interviewed band members and even researched analyses made by teenagers who claimed to know the song's true meaning. The Bureau eventually gave up because they were unable to interpret any wording in the record. Number 7. Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In The FBI can't take a joke. In 1971, the Bureau penned a 21-page report after Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In made fun of Hoover and the FBI. In one sketch, a troop of ditzy cheerleaders wore FBI garb. In another, actors pretended to talk to Hoover through a potted flower, suggesting that the FBI had bugged the plant. It obviously hurt the Bureau's fragile feelings. Some of the so-called jokes were not only not humorous, but did not make any sense. The sight gags were ridiculously stupid, and the fight song featuring the cheerleaders was to a great extent unintelligible. According to the file, the most hurtful line was this knock-knock joke, which it called vicious and sick type. Knock-knock. Who's there? Hoover. Hoover who? Hoover heard of a 76-year-old policeman? Oh, that's so naughty. Number 8. I Was a Communist for the FBI Movie In 1941, an FBI agent named Matthews Vettick joined the Communist Party with the objective of spying on its members. A decade later, Zvetik wrote about his spy adventures. His story appeared in the Saturday Evening Post and was eventually picked up by Warner Brothers, who turned it into an ultra-patriotic but romanticised film called I Was a Communist for the FBI. The film made the Bureau a little nervous. Some parts of it revealed how the FBI operated. Others were just gross misrepresentations. The FBI reported that Zvetik has no right to presume to speak for the FBI. It might be necessary for us to publicly deny Svetik's alleged insinuations. The FBI later denied that Svetik had ever even been an agent. And finally, number nine, the classic of all classics, this one, Roswell's UFO. You may be surprised to learn that the file that made UFOs and weather balloons famous is only one page long. And there's actually a scan of it at the show notes, with lots of blacking out, of course. But the text of the article goes as follows. Headquarters 8 Air Force. Telephonically advised this office that an object purporting to be a flying disc was recovered near Roswell, New Mexico, this date. The disc is hexagonal in shape and was suspended from a balloon by cable, which balloon was approximately 20 feet in diameter. Censored. Further advised that the object found resembles a high altitude weather balloon with a radar reflector. But that telephonic conversation between their office and Wright Field had not borne out this belief disc and balloon being transported to Wright Field by special plane for examination. Information provided this office because of national interest in case. And fact that National Broadcasting Company, Associated Press and others attempting to break story of location of disc today. Advised would request Wright Field to advise Cincinnati office results of examination. No further investigation being conducted. Well, by the looks of that, we still know nothing.
Well, everyone, that concludes episode 57 of the Mysteries Abound podcast, The Death of Superman. And to bring today's podcast to a close, I'm featuring another track from the artist Sora. This time it's from her Heartwood album, and it's entitled Children of Leah. And if you're interested in Sora's music, there's a link at the show notes, www.soramusic.ca. Until next time, everyone, this is Paul saying bye for now. When I'm